Well, thank you very much. That was the original plan. It turns out that the Apple keynote's going on right now, and I am neither the thinnest nor the lightest thing on a stage right now. It's not a dad bod, it's a father figure. But I digress. It's fine, they release anything good, just shout it out midway, it'll be fine. Yes, I want to talk a little bit about the myth of multi-cloud. And what do we mean by multi-cloud? Great question, I'm glad I asked it. Let's say that you decide to write some code, as you do, dressing well, as I do. And you decide that you want to be able to seamlessly deploy whatever it is you've built to GCP, to AWS, to Azure, and for some unfathomable reason, Oracle Cloud as well. And you want to be able to seamlessly have that flow between all of those environments. And what happens? That's right. You catch it on fire. And then you're responsible folks, mostly. And you try to put it out. And that's right, you catch on fire. And then you tell me about these stories, and I catch on fire. Which leads us to a great segue. Who the hell am I? My name's Corey Quinn, and I'm a cloud economist. Two words no one can define, so no one ever calls me on it. Generally, we start with cloud, which is a bunch of other people's computers, and economist, someone who claims to know everything about money, but dresses like a flood victim. And put them together, no one calls me on it. How does this wind up impacting us? Well, I see a lot of environments, and I look at a lot of bills, and this winds up leading to some interesting insights you only ever get from the very bottomless depths of Excel. <laughs> Let's go back in time. I you remember uh, 2012? It was a halcyon era, and we thought things were going to be different, like the world was going to end. And it kind of did, but that's a separate argument. And there were a lot of good arguments back then about going with multiple cloud providers. For example, what if you went all in on a provider and they turned the whole thing off? What if they added a zero to the bill? Well, that suddenly changes the economics a little bit. And what happens for those of us working on these things? Well, that's coming to take our jobs away. And it turned out that these were all concerns of note, but for the most part, they didn't happen. And now in 2019, it's a very different story. I mean, some of it did. If you take a look back into Verizon Public Cloud, which people's response to that is Verizon had a cloud? Eh, kinda. They wound up having a number of customers of very trusting sorts, and then one day sent out an email that in about a month or so, we're gonna be turning the cloud off for 48 hours over the course of a weekend for, I don't know, cleaning or something. And at first, their customers were super pissed. And then they weren't their customers anymore. And today, there is no Verizon Public Cloud. So yeah, if you went all in on Verizon Public Cloud, you kind of bet on the wrong horse. And that's okay, we all make dumb decisions, but it happens. And it turns out, from a costing perspective, that the prices in the cloud do change in a downward direction. So far, Google Maps boosting the cost of their API calls by 14x is the only real notable case of things getting more expensive. The trend is down, not up. And as far as job loss, well, it turned out that the cloud was not the reason I got fired a lot. So you can sort of guess what might have been instead. And this becomes an interesting story. Now, people might wonder exactly whether or not I guess I'm biased or whatnot, because I deliver snark to AWS on a pretty consistent and ongoing basis. Uh, making fun of them is my true joy in life. And they deliver services, sort of, and I deliver jokes, kind of, and it's sort of a natural pairing, but I don't work for them. I'm not here to advocate for any particular cloud. I don't care what you use. Use whatever makes you happy. I'm here because of my endearing and ongoing love affair with the sound of my own voice. I continue. A lot of people talk though about, oh, we're multi-cloud, so obviously everything I'm talking about here is completely wrong, which is fair, but remember, I look at bills. I start scratching beneath the surface of the we're multi-cloud companies, and it usually breaks down a little something like this. 
where it's, yeah, we're multi-cloud, cool. Let me know when you cross 10% of spend on your secondary cloud. The phone never rings. People pick something and they tend to focus on that and then use a service for some, uh, some other provider for one workload or they'll use it for backup, which is a sound strategy. I'm not saying any of this is bad, but I am saying the narrative around this changes. For example, I write a sarcastic newsletter every week called Last Week in AWS. Anyone here subscribe? Yay, a few people. Hopefully I'll get a few more of you by the end of this. This is the no joke workflow that I use to build this thing every week. It turns out that there's a whole bunch of Lambda functions. I have a custom markdown derivative called snarkdown because of course I do. And it lets me generate this thing pretty easily. And it goes through that entire pipeline. I consider myself all in on the AWS side of the stack on this. But the other providers don't. For example, I use G Suite for collaboration purposes and my Office 365 because I like pain and the world still uses Excel. Uh, who here is a Microsoft Azure customer? A lot of hands are not up. Are you sure? <laughs> Guess what business unit it all rolls up to? It's impossible to get an apples to apples comparison. So we can't trust the provider numbers because no, one, no two providers account for things the same way. We can't necessarily trust what people say about this, but I don't see it. I don't see workloads flowing between environments. So why are we talking about it? Why is everyone pushing for this? And it turns out that there are a lot of different interests in the space that have compelling business reasons to agitate for a multi-cloud world. This might be a little on the nose, but I stand by it. There's an entire category of providers who realize if you pick a provider and go all in, it's not going to be on them. So us too becomes a viable strategy. And there's an entire ecosystem of companies out there, good companies building awesome things and also VMware. And if <laughs> that they're in a world where if they wind up build, if they, you wind up going all in on a provider, and I don't care which one, they're not going to have much left to sell you. Because at that point, you'll just use whatever the provider gives for the most part. There are notable exceptions. We are at a monitoring conference, and I will trust AWS to tell me that they're down and the site is having problems just as soon as they can update their status page in a reasonable period of time. They bring a whole new meaning to the term static website. So what's the problem with it? I mean, it's easy for me to get on stage and talk a lot of smack. I mean, it is my first language and all. But what's the problem with doing this? And there are a lot of angles to go at it from, but the one I like is that you're fundamentally bound to whatever is common between all of the different providers. That looks like VMs, that looks like block storage, load balancers, okay, maybe a managed database, but they all tend to interact a little bit differently, and that's about it. So fundamentally, what you're doing at that point is going to build on top of those everything else you need. Well. These providers have higher level services that solve these problems. But if you have to have a workload flow seamlessly between them, you're not able to use them because they don't look alike at all. And you have to go back and build things on top of these primitives. And as a result, you're buying optionality that you're not going to use and paying for it with feature velocity. Well, what if we have to move in five years? Deal with it then. Get there first. You have to stay afloat that long and continue to grow. Again, pick a provider. I don't care which one. And then go all in. You also see resume-driven development, which is the only thing I can assume that accounts for some approaches. But people are trying to build these massive platforms to do what? Well, Amazon did it or Facebook did it. Yeah, back in those days, there wasn't an option like public cloud. There kind of is now. If you're starting a company aimed at something, if it's not in your core competency to solve these platform problems, why do it? You also can't get away from a concept of data gravity. Uh, I, I've heard people express this different ways that aren't nearly self-aggrandizing, so I'm going to call it Quinn's Law, where Wherever your data lives is where your compute will follow. Because it is easier to move compute to your data than it is to move data to your compute. Does anyone know how much it costs to move one terabyte of data in AWS? That's right, no one knows. Because it's impossible to determine based upon where it's going, how it's working, what side of it you're going to. There are two errors on that, by the way, and that is still a draft document. So be aware that there are a couple of changes still being worked out of this. But this is the easy to read version. There's a more complex version out there. And 
it's impossible to figure out what it's going to cost to move data, so all you can assume is it's going to be expensive, bring money, which is generally a safe bet. And that winds up driving a lot of a, a, a multi-cloud story. You also have accountants out there. You ever met one of those? Interesting creatures. And if you just decide to seamlessly move a $50 million workload between providers without telling them that you're doing it and they find out after the fact, they have a reaction. It's not good. They're mean. There are counterpoints here. I am used to being on the internet. Now, I'm not a woman on the internet, so I don't get it nearly as bad as a lot of other folks do. And I look like this. So I am presumed to know what I'm talking about. Spoiler, I don't. But no one questions me because I'm loud and I'm wearing a suit and I'm a white cis straight guy. Different world. That doesn't make it right. But you want to wind up building something on top of GCP because you love some of their machine learning services. And you're in love with the exhilarating adrenaline dump when they turn off something you've come to depend on. <laughs> Great. Fine. Go ahead and use it. I understand that. And you want to go ahead and use AWS because you aren't complete unless you're using a well-built out, scaled out service with a profoundly stupid name. Like Systems Manager Session Manager. Not making that one up. That's on them. Okay, great, do that too. And you want to use Microsoft Azure, because that's right, everyone has corporate IT needs, and that tends to be a decent place for those kind of workloads. Great, go ahead and run Corp IT on top of Azure. And because you're the uh, editor of, I don't know, Beat the Crap Out of Me magazine, you decide you want to use Oracle for some godforsaken reason, and no, you don't get love for that. You're making a poor decision by using Oracle, but you know what you're getting. Awesome. There's also, I'm not saying that not using different providers here is necessarily a bad thing for different workloads. What I'm talking about is this idea, seamlessly move VMs from place to place, that treats the cloud as just a place to run a bunch of VMs. And if that's all you need, have fun, but it sounds like a terrible environment. There's always the question as well of, well, what about single vendor issues here? If we just say, we just give all of our spend to one provider, that's going to do unfortunate things and we have no negotiating leverage. Discounts are volume based with every major provider and trying to hedge people against each other to save, let's say 2% on a hundred million dollar uh, spend annually, that's two million bucks. How much work are you doing to maintain that portability? It doesn't work. You take a look at a lot of Terraform environments where people try and be able to do DR on a different provider and the entire approach it sounds good, but it's like a DR plan. You try and test it and it breaks and you iterate forward, it breaks again and finally you get something that kind of works and then you put the binder on the shelf and the next commit because it's going to break it again, but it checks a box. Unless you're doing active, active deployments across providers, it won't work. Trust me on that one. There's always the argument of, well, we don't necessarily want to deal with Amazon. That's their president and CTO, by the way. And because what happens if Amazon, dun, 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 becomes a competitor? I have bad news for you. What do you mean if? <laughs> Amazon's director of product strategy is a post-it note that says yes on it. They lie awake at night worried that someone else who isn't them could be making money at a thing. If that is a strategic <laughs> problem for you, great, I'm not saying you're wrong. Don't pick Amazon, pick something else. I don't care what cloud you use. You probably care what cloud you use. I don't care. It's all the same to me. And there's always the idea of, well, we're doing a migration, and the migration sucks, so we want to be able to, we can do this seamlessly from place to place. So we're going to build it in a way that we can migrate anywhere, including into a window. It doesn't go well. You need to pick a provider and partner with them. Whether you like it or not, when someone else runs your entire produ production infrastructure, they're not your vendor anymore. They're your partner. So calling them on the phone and berating them is not a great strategy. Ask me how I know. There are occasions where you have a workload to put in multiple providers because you have to, and it makes sense. I'd like to address a few of them now. For example, PagerDuty talks about this from time to time. That's the company, for those of you who aren't aware, provides wake up, asshole, as a service at two in the morning when your site goes down. And the thing that wakes you up works across multiple providers, but their marketing site doesn't. 
You adjust the settings on it, if they're taking a total outage of one provider, that's probably not going to go so well. But the core functionality stays up. For something that needs to be more durable than any one provider, it can be a viable strategy. But understand, you're going to wind up incurring an awful lot of pain by getting that durability, and in many cases, damaging your availability further than if you hadn't done it at all. So be careful about this stuff. If what you're building is life critical, yeah. Find a way to make that go. But most things aren't. We show ads to people. Let's not, let's not make that grander than it really is. There are also concerns. I'm not saying if you work at one of those soul-sucking places, but where they, if they become a partner, they say, look, none of our data is going to live on Amazon because we're going to drive them into submission. And that's right. Not using DynamoDB is how we're going to do it. It's going to go super well. Awesome. Great. Best of luck. I do understand not wanting to give money to your competitor, but if you're servicing a company like this, you don't often have a choice. There are ways to talk around it, but they're not guaranteed. And depending on what you need to do, maybe you need to have a subset of your services packageable and able to ship somewhere else. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. There has to be a strategic direction to go in. I'm not talking about absolutes. I'm talking about best practices, or as I like to call them, sensible defaults. And if you live in Europe, for example, there are all kinds of data locality requirements you have to adhere to. And we have this little thing called GDPR that keeps people up at night. On the other hand, if you're based in the United States, you absolutely have nothing like GDPR to keep you up at night. But if you need to have data in a place where your provider doesn't have something, step one, call them and yell. Secondly, I get it. You have to obey the law. Ethics in tech, who let me in here? I know, I know. Even our data center cages remain child-free. It's contentious now. Who knew? And I'm also not saying it's terribly bad if you have multiple lines of business. If you acquire a company that is running either on-prem or in a different provider, migrating all of them into a different cloud provider probably doesn't need to happen. You also don't need to have a complete graphical dashboard into the state of all of the different providers cross-cutting. You don't really care what you're spending on storage for access charges on two different, complete separate lines of business. You care about the roll-up, not the nitty-gritty. Although if you're, you know, Microsoft and you acquire LinkedIn and they finally wait until now to start moving to Azure, okay, I get that. Uh, oh, to be clear, they did say that they were not required to go to Azure. They looked at all the clouds and Azure just happened to be the best. <laughs> right. I don't know their workloads. Maybe they're right. The point I'm making here is pick a provider and go all in unless you have a compelling reason to do it. And a marketing campaign by someone else, not a compelling reason. Because you think it's a best practice? It's not. Ben Kehoe, with the, one of the cloud roboticists over at iRobot, had a wonderful observation about this. Specifically, how do we know that cow tipping is not real? Simply put, there are no videos of it on YouTube. By a similar vein, there is no one on stage during a VMworld keynote saying, yes, we have built this multi-cloud workload for all of our stuff, and we can seamlessly deploy it everywhere. They got up and talked about that with a mythical t-shirt company they made up three weeks ago, specifically to demonstrate this. And it was a little stretched at times. And here's how we run Kubernetes to sell t-shirts. And here's how we provision a data center rack that shows up a week later. Right, that's how you sell t-shirts. Can't imagine how expensive those things must be. But good for them. I'm not saying I'm right, but I'm also not saying that I'm wrong either. My name's Corey Quinn. I'm a cloud economist. If you disagree with anything I've said, please accost me in the hallway. I look forward to it. If you've enjoyed my crappy sense of humor, please visit lastweekinaws.com, where I have a newsletter, a couple of podcasts, and a small consultancy that fixes screamingly unfortunate bills. Thanks for listening to my nonsense. <laughs>